So thank you, everyone, for coming today. I'd like to just start our proceedings in the way that we do in British Columbia, where I hail from, by recognizing the First Nations on whose traditional territory we're holding this meeting. And uh, although we have 203 First Nations in British Columbia, there seem to be probably about 200 who shared this territory. Uh, too many to name, but it's a wonderful gathering place, obviously. And Toronto, we're gathered here today for that reason as well. It's just a, a perfect place for us all to meet from across the country. I uh, also wanted to um, wish a welcome, bienvenue à cette réunion. Uh, je regrette que la séance aujourd'hui se déroulera uniquement en anglais. Cependant, pour ceux qui veulent, nous vous encourage de partager vos commentaires et poser vos questions en français en utilisant le hashtag Twitter. Et c'est sur l'écran, je crois, pas celui-ci, mais euh, une des de les écrans. Il y aura beaucoup d'autres à travers du pays les, avec lesquels vous serez en dialogue. So uh, that was just to say, we have people across the country, although these proceedings here today are going to be conducted in English, and we don't have simultaneous interpretation, we regret, but um, we're hoping that people will participate in the language of their choice using uh, the Twitter, live Twitter that we have. And you'll see over on, uh, to my right, uh, a Twitter wall that will keep track of what's going on. This is really exciting. We've got over 300 people, I think over 350 people registered to attend the event in person, but we have uh, now got 12 satellite sites across the country, and the satellite sites were designated as sites that had a minimum of 10 people. They were going to gather and watch the live web stream and participate using Twitter in this uh, dialogue, and we're going to be punting some of their questions up to the front so that we can share with you every now and again the kinds of comments and questions that they are posing. So we have people at the University of Lethbridge, and if they were out there, we could hear them cheering, although I think it's only, what, 8 o'clock, 8.15 in, in Lethbridge now. Um, Dalhousie University, uh, the uh, health professions there, the University of Northern British Columbia, we have two sites, one in Prince George and one in Quesnel, and it's only 7.15 there. University of Victoria, University of Ottawa Institute of Population Health, Health PEI is participating, the Ministry of Health in British Columbia, the University of Calgary Institute for, for Public Health, the New Brunswick Department of Health, and Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, their Decision Support Unit, and Queen's University. So that's really exciting, and I also understand that the Canadian Institute for Health Information has a site that's set up with a, at least 40 people participating. So I imagine, and we have about 350 people individuals who registered before today. So we're anticipating there's probably at least 800 people uh, listening in in various places across the country to the dialogue, um, which is quite exciting. Um, so I wanted to just give you a sense of what we hope to achieve today. You'll see the name of this session, we're marking the 10th anniversary of the publication of the report, the Romano Report. Um, and it's really looking retrospectively, what, what, was, what was the ground like back 10 years ago? But more importantly, where are we now and what do we have in the future? What are Canadians' aspirations and what do we need to do to transform the system in order to meet those, uh, those aspirations into the future? So we kind of want to identify some of the challenges that existed in the past, but we really want to move more towards what's in the future and, um, and how can we address these? What are the kinds of roles and responsibilities, not only roles of government, but roles of some of the key players, the, the health authorities in some jurisdictions, um, the, the clinicians, the, the pr professionals, the workers in the healthcare system, the, the, uh, the patients and family members and so forth. What are the kinds of roles that they're going to have to embrace as we move to transform the system? The way it's going to work is we've got short um, panel presentations that are going to be about, in this case, our speakers will speak for about 15 minutes, and then uh, we're going to open it up to dialogue. And I'm going to call on a few people that I know are in the audience. I'm just going to kind of point to them and call on them to start the dialogue. Um, and then we're going to, uh, I'll try to keep track of the hands that go up. I don't know everyone in the room, but when I see your hand go up, I'll try and write your name down or position, and I'll point sort of in the general direction of where you are. We have four mic runners, and uh, it's going to be really important that you use the microphone to uh, make your com comments and, and um, uh, to, to pose any questions that you have, because we're going to be reading those straight into the record, and they have to go um, into, the, into the video and, and the tape tape that we're doing. I'd like to ask you when you do uh, get the hold of that microphone that you make your, uh, your contribution really focused and short. We don't want sort of long elaborate statements just because we have so many people and we really want to get some dialogue happening and don't forget we're getting a lot of that on the Twitter as well. 
I'd also ask that you would introduce yourself when you're holding that microphone, say who you are and where you're from, so that, um, again, we can read that into the record. I have one more ground rule, and that is to um, avoid the use of acronyms if we can. I call them four-letter non-words. But um, the problem is that we have a diverse audience here, again, from across the country, and we are working in both official languages. And it's very, very hard to kind of figure out what does that acronym mean. And uh, you'll see there's slides rotating here that include the Health Council of Canada and all of our other many sponsors. We expect you to have those acronyms memorized. Um, but we do, uh, we are very, very appreciative of our, our sponsors who've made it possible not only for us to be here today, but also to be able to live stream this and to invite um, a large student contingent that we have here today. Um, it's a really great, diverse group. So um, thank you to them very, very much. I'm now going to hand things over to my president, Dr. Ottleston Brown, who will tell you, a who will do a little bit of a lead in to our, our presenters here. So welcome. This is the Canadian Association for Health Services Policy and Research. Hopefully I can use CASPER now as an acronym uh, just this once. Our first annual policy forum. CASPER strives to be a voice and a reflection of all the people in Canada who make or use evidence to create a better health system. And it's actually a good time to be in the evidence business. Here in Ontario, but across the country as well, Health systems are struggling with the effects of rapid cost growth and a global financial crisis that points to a challenge to sustainability. Every system is turning now explicitly to evidence, whether to be answered questions about fundamental questions about how we should organize our health system or fundamentally important questions about how patients and clinicians should work together to get and to stay as healthy as they can be. So it's fitting this morning that we anchor ourselves to a report that 10 years ago brought together values and evidence and dealt with the issue of what was fundamental to us in our healthcare system. Some of those values, supported by evidence, have had resonance over a decade. And this year, we saw probably the most comprehensive, but also the most provocative set of performance data come out on a pan-Canadian stage. That calls for attention, and actually, through that attention, calls for accountability. Others of these values have found new life. We talk a little less about new programs now, but we still talk about making sure that people get the care that they need. Not access to a sector, not access to a profession, but access to a whole bundle of care that will help them as they move forward. I don't want to say much more than that because the point of the day is to get the debate and the discussion going with the people who've been kind enough to share their time. And I'm grateful to our speakers. I'm grateful to the Health Council of Canada, without whom this would have been impossible. And as you can tell from the pace and the energy that Lillian opened the day, I'm grateful to Lillian for getting us going today. With that, welcome, and I'll turn it over to Stuart. So I get to go first. It's like a golden opportunity for vengeance, right? All those times when I have spoken quickly because others before me have gone long. Uh, I'm going to start uh, my 45-minute presentation then on Canadian attitudes about the healthcare system with a quick, with some quick notes on where I want to take the next 10-minute talk. Uh, I'm going to take it as a given that uh, health policy in Canada, and in fact health policy all around the developed world, uh, is at least in part a function of public preferences for policy. Let's just take that as an assumption. I've, uh, normally I pitch, I, I begin with some demonstrations of the link between what people want and what people get uh, in healthcare policy in Canada, in the US, in the UK, and around the world. Uh, and I'm going to launch right into the structure of public opinion on healthcare, in part because I think that uh, using public opinion properly, understanding the state of public opinion, and then actually using that public opinion to uh, understand and make healthcare policy requires, I think, a kind of sensible uh, idea of how public opinion is structured. And there is in the healthcare field, actually across 
many policy domains, there is, uh, I think, a misunderstanding of what seems to be disjunctures in public opinion, noise in public opinion, that I want to argue is not noise. Uh, then I want to talk about kind of what drives that opinion, where do public attitudes about healthcare come from, uh, and then we kind of get to the meat of things, the recent trends uh, in public opinion over time. Across countries, I'm going to focus actually on a very recent survey uh, that compares attitudes in Canada with attitudes in the U.S. This is uh, fascinating for a whole and timely for a whole variety of reasons. We'll be, it looks like Obamacare will be around for a little bit. Uh, so let's talk about the structure of public opinion on health care. I want to make the argument, and this is drawing on a piece uh, with uh, Pierre Martin and Antonia Maoni, and you'll see I'm kind of in very, very light gray at the bottom of my slides. Uh, each slide I'm drawing on different, uh, on different papers, so that's my version of citation. Um, I want to make the argument that we should view attitudes about most policy domains in the same way in which the literature on views about the economy has viewed views about the economy. So people interested in uh, attitudes about the economy uh, have tended to distinguish between four different types of attitudes. On the one hand, attitudes about the future versus attitudes about the past, so uh, prospective attitudes, what you think the economy is going to do in the future, versus retrospective attitudes, how you think the economy has been going. And on the other hand, they distinguish between egotropic and sociotropic attitudes, how you think your own income is doing and how you think your, in, uh, your income will do in the future. So egotropic, how, how do you think how do you think your income is? How do you think your income is going to be in the future? Sociotropic. How do you think the country's economy has been doing? How do you think the country's economy is going to be doing in the future? And that kind of fourfold structure has been very valuable in understanding how it is attitudes about the economy evolve and where uh, you know what the various drivers of the various components of attitudes about the economy. This. Th that structure, though, isn't just exclusive to the, to the economy. There are a whole range of policy domains in which we can apply uh, basically that structure, and doing so helps us make sense of what seem to be quite divergent or diverging views uh, amongst the Canadian public. It helps us to understand why one trend is going up and one trend is going down, namely because one trend is capturing one of these four elements and another trend is capturing another of these four elements. And it's actually quite sensible, for instance, to think, I think healthcare is good right now, but I'm very worried about it in the future. And this is, as we'll see, the kind of modal opinion in Canada. So let's kind of keep that fourfold structure in mind and think about kind of what drives the various, um, uh, the various elements of public opinion. Here I'm just kind of flagging three, and those arrows aren't meant to mean that those things only matter in one box or the other box. They all matter to varying degrees for in, in each of the four uh, elements of uh, public attitudes about healthcare, but to varying degrees, right? We might expect media content plays a greater role in thinking about the future of healthcare because you don't ha you can't rely just on your own personal experience when you're asked a question about, do you think we'll be able to fund healthcare 10 years from now? There's nothing about my recent visit to the doctor, or, or only a little bit at least, from my recent visit to the doctor that helps me answer that question. So there are some uh, ways of thinking about healthcare that are going to be driven more by, for instance, interpersonal communication, how much you, you know, you'll talk to friends about their experiences, or you'll hear stories from someone else about someone else about someone else who had to go in for heart surgery. And this is part of what drives your attitudes. Then there is, of course, your own personal experience and media content, that all those things matter simultaneously, albeit to varying degrees, from one prospective to retrospective, sociotropic to egotropic, makes it important, for instance, that over time there are, uh, there are emphases in media on different elements of the, of the healthcare system. And so here what you're seeing is a trend in Globe and Mail and Toronto Star stories uh, focusing on wait lists. Right? So we all know that wait lists have been a particularly salient uh, element in the uh, kind of ongoing public debate about the healthcare system in Canada. And we went through a period uh, uh, centered around uh, 2006 or so. We went through a period where wait lists were really uh, a lot of healthcare reporting was about wait lists. Uh, that's a, I mean, a huge proportion actually of, of healthcare reporting focused on the system in general. There's always a certain amount of like how to stay healthy and why you should not smoke and all, all um, kind of exercise and fitness related articles. But healthcare policy, general healthcare policy articles, a huge proportion focused on wait lists. And that, that's meaningful because we know that alongside that there was a spike in the proportion of Canadians who thought that, health, that wait lists were particularly bad. 
Right? We see some trend in concern about wait lists roughly in line with the trend that we see in media content, particularly when we ask questions that talk about prospective views. Do you think that things are going to be getting better? Do you think that you will be able to get access to healthcare when you need it? Kind of prospective views can get affected by media content about wait lists, for instance. Retrospective views, less so. You're basing it on your, uh, basing it on your own experience. <laughs> okay, well now I know. Uh, that's not to say that it's all about media content. Sometimes it's about experience, and this is just a, this is a graphic drawn from a paper that tries to extract the impact of waiting to see a doctor on your general attitudes about the healthcare system, right? So this is about confidence in the, in the system, uh, just a general question about confidence in the system. And I don't want to talk about the details so much as point to the fact that waiting has a statistically significant negative impact on your overall views of system confidence. So for instance, if you need to wait a day, that's not very long, but if you need to wait a full day in order to get in to see a doctor when you need to, when you need to see a doctor, that has a lasting effect on your, uh, uh, on your confidence in the, Canadian, uh, in the Canadian healthcare system. If you need to wait more than an hour in an emergency room, that has a lasting effect on your confidence in the Canadian healthcare system. Now that, I, I mean, I don't want to make too much of the, of the point estimates, too much, of the, too much of the details. I just want to flag that, while on the one hand, I want to talk about how, how uh, media content matters, at the same time, experience matters. We're not looking at public attitudes that are just uh, uh, that are moving back and forth with whatever the Globe and Mail happens to print that morning, there's some, uh, there's some structure and stability to Canadian public attitudes, and that's partly a function of actual experience with the system. And it isn't that all experiences with the system are negative. Uh, I don't want to stake my career on my division of uh, the two different types of care. What I'm trying to do here, and these are just uh, kind of shortcuts, uh, that you see on the slide. What I'm trying to do here is distinguish between people that need some kind of acute care immediately and people that need some kind of ongoing care for some kind of uh, chronic issue. And if you are, uh, if we distinguish between those two types of respondents, you see people that need immediate care tend to, on average, uh, be more positively disposed uh, to the system afterwards, as in the, the, that, that, that type of care tends to leave you more confident in the system. Other types of care don't necessarily. So there is a uh, I don't know why this part works. Uh, there is a, um, a link between what you're getting and uh, how you feel about a healthcare system. That's kind of evidence that we should take seriously, I think, uh, public attitudes about healthcare. So this is the healthcare policy mood. Uh, the, one of the difficulties in working with public opinion on healthcare is that there aren't many questions asked consistently over time. What we really want is a trend in attitudes about healthcare and how people feel about the healthcare system over time. And in order to do that, this is the product of a complicated algorithm that allows me to take a whole series of actually different questions over time, stick them in a box, shake it around, and then pull out the kind of the common component in those series? What's the kind of underlying trend uh, across all kinds of attitudes about the Canadian healthcare system? This is what we get. We see kind of declining attitudes up to about 2002, 2003, and then steadily improving attitudes since that time. And I'm sure many people in the room will have a sense for, uh, for why that's the case, a better sense than I do, surely, uh, for, for why that's the case. So in one sense, the state of public opinion now, as opposed to the state of public uh, opinion 10 years ago, is much, much better. We see a kind of general uh, healthcare policy mood that is much, much better than it was uh, uh, 10 years ago. But underlying that, uh, this kind of general policy mood, there actually are some differing, there are some differing trends. And so if we, kind of, if we pull apart a few of the series, if we pull apart a few of the questions, we can see actually that there are, there, uh, there, it's not as though there are no sources of concern. Here we're looking at retrospective egotropic attitudes. So it's asking you about your level of care in the past. And uh, I don't want to, the details are, uh, are in the slide. I just want to focus on the direction of the red line, right? What we see is over the past 10 years, a kind of gradual increase, a gradual improvement in people's assessments of their health care system, right? So that kind of fits with what we saw in policy mood. Policy mood, as it turns out, because of the questions that, are used to gen that I use to generate health care policy mood, is driven by and large by these retrospective assessments. The retrospective trend dominates healthcare policy mood. But the prospective trend is just as important, and the prospective trend actually is moving in quite a different, quite a different direction. If we look over the past 10 years, views about the ongoing, like whether you personally will be able to get the healthcare you need in the future, their views are going down. 
And the, the reason it's important, I think, to distinguish between these kind of four different types of healthcare attitudes is that too often I, I see interpretations of public opinion that say, well, Canadians think this is good and this is bad and this is good and this. And, 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 and the, the common perspective, or a common perspective, seems to be that this indicates a kind of flaw in public attitudes, that people don't really know what they want. Uh, and uh, that's why there's this noise. That's why you have these differing trends. But in fact, it's quite possible, as I've noted, to think I'm getting good care now, but I'm increasingly concerned about the ongoing viability of the system. And that's precisely what we see in trends over the past, uh, over the past 10 years. How do we compare with the US? Uh, so here I'm drawing from a recent survey that asked Canadians and Americans actually about their own systems and about, and about the others' systems. Uh, but I want to focus just on our views of our own system on this kind of general quality of medical care question. Uh, it's a five-point scale, right? So I'm just taking the average of the five-point scale. Uh, and uh, what I find fascinating is that we have exactly the same point estimate in the Canadian case as in the US case. 60, 66%. I mean, it actually is, uh, you know, 0.66 on a one to, on a zero to one scale, but 66%, uh, that's that kind of the point estimate and kind of quality of, or our sense of the quality of care in the two countries is absolutely the same. That I find very interesting. And now I want to think about it in terms of, well, why isn't it, let's say, 85%? What is it that makes it 66 as opposed to 85? And in the two systems, you'll see uh, the two questions uh, that I have to the right, you'll see that there are two different concerns, right? In Canada, it's about, uh, it's about uh, con concerns about, about waiting to get care, right? It's a con concern, it's an access issue uh, that is uh, worse in the Canadian case than in the U.S. case. In the U.S. case, predictably, it's a, it's a different kind of access issue, as in whether you will be able to pay for your care. So in the Canadian case, access is about, is about waiting for care. In the U.S. case, access is about paying for care, and this is a kind of classic uh, trade-off that we're all, uh, that uh, healthcare policymakers are all, uh, are all grappling with at this time. I find that kind of a nice uh, comparison. So I guess overall, uh, my pitch is something like this. Uh, Canadians, I would say the modal Canadian actually, is moderately pleased, only moderately, but moderately pleased with the existing Canadian healthcare system. And ongoing support for the healthcare model, and ongoing support is important, right, because I am assuming that uh, the development of healthcare policy is at least partly a function of what citizens, what voting, what voters want in healthcare policy. Um, the ongoing support for the healthcare model depends, I think, on, on two different things, at least this is what we see in opinion. Uh, on the one hand, continued improvement in the quality and accessibility of healthcare. I don't think that's any great surprise, uh, where the emphasis is more on the accessibility side than on the quality side, and we see that when we drill further down into public opinion. The questions that really elicit real concern are about access, not about quality. People generally are happy with the care they get from their doctor, but they're just worried about whether they can get in to see their doctor. Um, so we need to think on the one hand about that. On the other hand, uh, uh, I think healthcare policymakers need to think about a kind of a version of a healthcare model, or maybe communicating a version of a healthcare model that Canadians believe is sustainable over the long term. Because one of the reactions to negative prospective views, even as we're experiencing, having largely positive experiences in the existing system, one of the reactions to thinking that that system is going to collapse is, as we have seen, and you can see this in, uh, in a variety of reports uh, and, uh, and polling results, one of, the, one, one of the implications is that people start to think more and more, that is Canadians start to think more and more about a, about a private system. So ongoing support for the system is dependent on one hand on the quality, on the existing quality of the system, but on the other hand also in convincing Canadians and in, in kind of communicating, uh, well building, and communicating a system that Canadians believe actually will be viable 10 years from now. Part of what policy is driven by now is what people think will be around in 10 years. That's all. Thanks. Thanks so much, Stuart. Now, we're going to hold the questions and comments until after both of our speakers have spoken. And so I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Greg Marshallden, who is the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of, from the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy. Greg and also formerly the executive director of the Romano Commission. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lillian, and 
And I guess I might as well start by saying now for something completely different, because uh, what I'm going to do is uh, reflect on the past and uh, talk about where we're at today and then talk about the future. And uh, I want to start with the retrospective. I want to start with going back to why the Romano Commission was established in the first place. And that's because we're 10 years on and some of these reasons are both forgotten and the environment at the time, uh, we've moved a long way since then and that environment may not be remembered in its full detail. To begin with, that period from 1990, 91 to 2001 was a period of where we went really from famine to feast. There was a debt crisis that was quite profound in the early to mid-1990s. The provincial governments put on the brakes in terms of health spending, and it was a little bit like pushing on a balloon, uh, and all the air went to the other end. And as a consequence of that, there was a great deal of dissatisfaction at the service delivery level in a number of provinces. That was then followed by major cuts to federal transfers as the federal government tried to get its own debt crisis dealt with. And then by about 1997, 98, governments began to reinvest again in healthcare in response to patient dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction of uh, users of the system, taxpayers, etc. And the federal government, too, again, following a few years later, began to tentatively put a bit more money back into uh, the health transfer. This w amounted to catch-up, but in all situations of catch-up, you're trying to repair damage that's been done, uh, and you still have enough problems that uh, people continue to be dissatisfied. And I think that's the reason Stewart pointed this out in his presentation. There was actually a pretty negative policy mood in 2001. And in terms of the federal government, it wasn't sure about the transfer. It wasn't sure what it should do, whether it should put more money back to bring it up to the levels that it had been in the past. And at a more fundamental level, I would argue that there was actually quite a a fundamental uh, division in cabinet on the federal role. There was also uh, some division within the cabinet that was further complicated by a bitter struggle over succession within the Liberal Party. So that was the general mood at the time. And it wasn't easy for the Prime Minister to decide on a policy off-ramp, the creation of a Royal Commission. In fact, the Prime Minister hated Royal Commissions. As far as he was concerned, every Royal Commission he had known had exceeded its mandate, had spent way more money than it was assigned, and had gone well beyond the time allotted. So this was not an easy decision for the Prime Minister or for Cabinet. In fact, we spent two to three weeks negotiating the mandate of the commission, and that is because the federal government wanted it as narrow as possible, and uh, Mr. Romano wanted it uh, as broad as possible, and we ended up somewhere in the middle. But where it was largely non-negotiable was in terms of time and money. It was very clear that the Prime Minister wanted this to be an 18-month Royal Commission. No Royal Commission of this type had ever been in such a short period. Normally, they were three to four years in the past. This was set at 18 months, less than half the time. And the, uh, the amount of money for the Commission was set. The ceiling was $15 million. Uh, and you can compare that to other Royal Commissions, such as the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, is just $55 million. I know that there have been comparisons to ministerial committees and to Senate committees, but those are not valid comparisons because a lot of the operating and infrastructure costs are taken on by those organizations. In a Royal Commission, you have to pay for all of those uh, infrastructure and operating costs. 
The next issue was the Prime Minister said that there was only one person that he trusted enough to do this commission, to stay on the mandate, to come in within the time period and within the fiscal resources, and that was Roy Romano. But there was a more profound reason beyond the fact that the two men had known each other for a long time and there was a high degree of trust. And that is that Mr. Romano had a long experience as a premier. He had dealt with hard trade-offs. He had dealt with the debt crisis. He understood the realities of governing. And that was the kind of person that the Prime Minister wanted. Second of all, he had a very deep understanding of federalism and how this country worked. And this experience was about three decades long. So why did Mr. Romano accept the mandate and why did we proceed as a commission? First of all, I think we saw a window of opportunity that there was a desire for movement and change. Uh, you could see it in terms of the premiers, at least some of them. You could see it in terms of some members of cabinet. You could see it in the general public. You could see it in certain civil society organizations. There was a desire, in a sense, to get out of this very negative policy mood to take some direction in this country. The next reason was that there was actually a federal dividend. And there was some willingness, at least in some part of that cabinet, to invest in change. Now that dividend was effectively spent in 2004. In my opinion, it did not, uh, it was not invested for, in change. Now while many things in healthcare have changed on the ground and had changed on the ground over a number of years, Medicare itself was frozen in time to the 1950s and 60s and the window of opportunity involved that the time had come to make a major directional decision. It was either to go forward, build on the single payer mechanism, expand universality, or go backward. Reduce public financing, uh, reduce taxation, rely more on private health insurance, rely more on out-of-pocket payments, and reduce universality. So, what has changed since the Romano report? I'm going to mention three things. The first is that the broad Canadian public was given an opportunity to express its preferences on these broad directional changes in the principles and values. This was after some of the most extensive and intensive consultations ever undertaken in this country. The citizens' dialogue, for example, went much deeper than your typical opinion survey in which individuals drawn from across this country in a day session had to make difficult decisions based on extremely difficult trade-offs and at the end of the day offered their opinions and in fact their opinions were relatively consistent across the country and in both languages. And they decided on the go-forward strategy, single-payer tax-based, single-tier universality. That was the majority, not everyone, but the majority, a clear majority, and no political leader can ignore this. Some members of the media and think tanks railed against this result. They feel that the public were ignorant and fooled by some kind of left-wing conspiracy but they can't really deny the results, and the public opinion polling still shows this, even if it's not as deep as the citizens' dialogue. The second thing that has changed is the recognition, I think, of the importance of intergovernmental mechanisms and institutions, that while primarily, uh, healthcare is primarily a provincial jurisdiction, healthcare is not the exclusive, within the exclusive jurisdiction of the provinces. The federal government does have some role, uh, and there is a role for civil society, and in fact, you need all three 
You need the federal and provincial governments. You need them operating at that intergovernmental level. And you need some civil society organizations involved. The way we've done this has been very innovative in this country through arm's length intergovernmental agencies. These have been actually a very highly innovative response to this very decentralized federation. And we have an alphabet soup of them, and I'm not allowed to uh, give you the acronyms and abbreviations. I'll just mention a few, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health. We've created these institutions just in the last few years. Some of them are interprovincial, like the Canadian Blood Services. Uh, but in the Romano report, there was the recommendation for the creation of a Health Council of Canada that could do this work on a pan-Canadian basis to provide some kind of direction and roll up in terms of health care reform generally. The idea in the Romano report was that this would be tied in with data and with health technology assessments so that there would be in effect a super uh, health council of Canada. Uh, the federal government decided to create a more narrowly based health council of Canada but thank God it exists. The third change that occurred was the, in terms of primary health care. And at the time of the report, there was virtually no activity. This is extremely important because it's not just first contact medical care. It is really the fusing of basic treatment with prevention and promotion. Absolutely critical. And finally, after decades of stasis, we now have some movement on that front. Uh, we recognize in this country that we have fallen behind a number of OECD countries. We can see that through the Commonwealth Fund studies, which focus quite heavily on, on primary health care. But I think there's an understanding that we now have a lot of work to do. Now, what has not changed since the Romano report? Uh, the Romano Report made a number of recommendations concerning the need for a focus on rural and remote health care. This is a huge country with a highly dispersed population. This results in limited access, high cost, poor health status and outcomes. While there's been some change in some spots, but there's been no major pan-Canadian effort in this area. The second I want to highlight, and this came out in the chapter on Aboriginal health care, we have a divided jurisdictions uh, in this area that we need to rethink and we need to improve quality access approach and the way in which we administer services in this area, the way in which federal, provincial, territorial and Aboriginal governments and organizations work together again. While there might be progress in a few provinces, there has been no major pan-Canadian initiative in an area. And in this area, you need that in order to make any major headway. The third I want to mention is that Medicare is still frozen in time. We have made no decision in this country to either expand or retract. That is not how it was designed, in fact. It was always designed to be a staged effort. When universal hospital care was introduced in the 1950s, the idea was there would be additions to that after. And that's what occurred in, 19, in the 1960s with the introduction of universal medical care coverage. In Saskatchewan, there was a list of priorities, and of course, medical care ended up at the top, but there were a number of things that were to follow. The same thing in the Hall Report. If you look at the six main recommendations, the first was for medical care and following a number of other services as fiscal resources would permit. So what we have is better than nothing, but we are missing some great opportunities by not making this decision. Clearly, in the Romano Report, it was a recommendation to move ahead, not to go backwards to an earlier time. We lose the opportunity for greater value for money through the single payer me mechanism, the administratively lower costs that are involved. The, it is a more effective mechanism for cost control than the alternatives. Uh, we lose the opportunity to bring in other services uh, the example of home care in the Romano report, how certain types of home care could be rolled into the universal basket. 
Uh, we lose the opportunity in terms of integrating these services into a more coordinated system. And we can actually more effectively encourage use of what should be more appropriate and in fact often less expensive services rather than these separately financed silos of services. And in the end, we can actually save more money on the hospital and physician side and take that money that we save and invest more in other areas, including primary health care and providers that are not currently privileged under our system, education, long-term care, home care, and I could go on and on. So, to conclude, and I have just 23 seconds, we still need to make a major directional decision in this country. And on financing and principles, it's clear where the Canadian public wants to go, despite concerns and differences about delivery. There's a majority of Canadians that want their governments to move. Whatever is said by the National Post or the Globe and Mail and think tank advocates. This still requires, as always, leadership at both the provincial and federal levels of government, not one acting with the, without the other, but at both levels, as well as civil society. And it would be a mistake to think that any one of these is sufficient on their own to make this big system change. Thank you for inviting me here today. Thanks, Greg. That's great. So I think this was a nice compliment. We were, um, as many of you will know, the um, Romano Commission report was based on values, and uh, so starting with sort of that sense of what what were the what are the underlying values, what were the underlying values, and then Greg's reflection a little bit more on the political landscape, uh, what were some of the constraints and so forth. I think is a, a great combination. I do want to open it up now for some dialogue. I'm looking at Shalom Gluberman here, and I'm just wondering whether. Um, Shalom, we might call on you because I think this whole idea about engaging um, the public and uh, patient experience and uh, particularly that notion of my own personal experience with the healthcare system and then projecting that onto what are my needs in the future and so forth, some observations. And you'll have to introduce yourself, Shalom. Well, my name so is Shalom Globerman and I'm the president of the Patients Association of Canada. Uh, I, I wrote one of the invited papers for the Romano Commission about uh, simple, complicated, and complex interventions. And uh, that, pa that paper sort of became the lead paper in the, in the book. So we were intimately involved with uh, developing some of the ideas for the Romano Commission. And the thing that's really interesting is the extent of patient engagement in the Romano Commission was a big change. It was a sea change. And I think it marked the beginning of the change of patient involvement in healthcare in Canada. Uh, I think that uh, there were two things, I think, in the history of Canada that have done that. The first is the La Lalonde Report, which, uh, which allowed people to take more responsibility for their own health, uh, and that was a big change. And I think the Romano Commission began people to, to think, start to think that they could actually engage in the system and talk about policy. I think that the Patients Association really follows from that. It's a next step. Uh, our, our role is to have patients engage in the system, across the system, both at, uh, individu as individuals uh, sitting on advisory committees in healthcare organizations, which they're beginning to do, uh, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, uh, and uh, at Baycrest, for example, where I work, patients and family members have redesigned the day of admission uh, quite successfully. Really interesting. And, and the day of admission is extraordinarily different from what it was six months ago, largely because of patient involvement and the patient perspective being brought online. I think that those kinds of changes and the, re the recognition for the importance of patient engagement in the system really comes from the fact that the morbidity of the population has shifted. And that was something that we talked about in, the Romano, in, the, in, the, in our report to Romano, that, that uh, the diseases that people have are no longer acute infectious diseases, but long-term chronic conditions. And for long-term chronic conditions, you absolutely need patient involvement and patient engagement. And so that shift, which is happening gradually, it's a shift that's happening through the move to patient-centered care and also to the move to involvement of patients and to the participation of patients in the system, though culturally the system has excluded them for 100 years. 
And that shift is a very hard shift to take, and I think that we're in the middle of it. Uh, and I think that some of the things that happened with the Romano Commission were on the way to it. So thank you. And I don't know whether Julia Abelson is in the audience here. Julia, is she here? She was meant from McMaster. She was um, instrumental in provide. Is she here? No. All right. Is that Doris? Hi. You have to introduce yourself, Doris. I will. I will be happy to do that. Thank you, Lillian. And uh, thank you to seeing you again, uh, all of you, and, uh, and uh, especially Greg. Uh, I'm Doris Greenspoon, Executive Director of RNO. Actually, they changed my title, sorry, a year ago, but I keep somehow forgetting. CEO of RNO. Um, a lot changed, and one piece is the elephant in the room that was not mentioned, Greg, and that's a federal government that is disengaged from, um, I would say, healthy public policy in the broader sense, and healthcare and social programs specifically. I don't know if you saw today the write-up in the Toronto Star about the latest uh, threat to health and healthcare, which is the idea of funding social services through bonds, okay? So it's a new one, outsourcing social services and the Canadian values. So I think it's important to speak about the elephant in the room because if we don't do something about engaging a federal government and disengaging a federal government from attacking civil society groups, one of the pillars that you mentioned, uh, we will be in bigger trouble than what we already are. And it's not only on health care, but it's on health in the broader sense. Uh, so, so I question, I question, um, First of all, why in the panel was not someone that uh, would bring these issues forward? And why we don't have the federal government speaking here? And I think we need to speak about that, because if not, uh, we, we are reminiscing about the Romano Commission, and I hope Mr. Romano is here. He was at the Stephen Lewis event. Here he is. And we all were tremendously engaged, and we all were tremendously engaged with courage, with passion, with values, with commitment. And I would say that we need to call on reclaiming those values, because actually Canadians have it. Canadians have it. We saw it in, the, in, in who wanted to actually have Obama south of the border. So we just need to translate those values into here. Great. Other, other observations? I, I'm, I'm wondering, Alan Maslov is here, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, Alan is at Carleton University and has been studying FedProv relations and, and in the health sector for, for many, many years. And uh, what, what are your observations about uh, relationships? You. you didn't have to say many, many years. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> Only a few. <laughs> One many would have been enough. Um, Thank you. Um, I wanted to, um, to respond to a point that uh, Greg made in his excellent opening comments. And I agree completely that, that the, um, with the, the statement that intergovernmental mechanisms have been important. There is an important federal role. Um, but unfortunately, I think the current government has pretty much abandoned, walked away from that role. Um, we can see, we saw that uh, simply in the way that uh, the Minister of Finance made the funding announcement in December of last year. Uh, we saw that, I think, in the statement, in the statement itself and in the statement that the Prime Minister made uh, a week or two following that. And basically what the federal government has said to the provinces is, here's some money. We're going to guarantee you the money for uh, a, a good period of time into the future. Uh, now go away, do your business, and don't bother us. Um, so three comments from that. One is we can rail against that, uh, but I don't think as long as the Harper government is on the scene that's going to change. Uh, secondly, can the provinces fill the vacuum themselves the, and, and provide this national uh, leadership that the, fed, that the federal government has, uh, has provided so many times in our history around Medicare. Um, my, my judgment based on experience is that, that they cannot, although I'd love to be proven wrong on that one. 
Uh, and then the third comment or question is perhaps there is, uh, Greg made the interesting observations about civil society organizations, perhaps there is some way in which civil society organizations can step into that vacuum and provide some of that national leadership. Thank you. I, uh, is this on? Yeah. Dennis Kendall, I'm here on behalf of the Health Council of Canada. Uh, two things struck me in the, in the two presentations, uh, in Stuart's presentation, how profoundly public opinions, at least egocentric public opinions, are influenced by more than one delay, day delay in access to seeing your doctor. And I want to link that then to Greg's comments about primary health care reform or redesign. Uh, and quite frankly, it's interesting that it's an area in which I don't think we've well uh, explained to the, to the population uh, the model or the vision of what we actually uh, believe evidence shows could be achieved by a, a remarkably transformed primary health care delivery system. So what we have basically is a medical model with, in some instances, bolted on you know, other team members, but we haven't fundamentally changed that model. And I'm a physician myself, and I'm not trying to denigrate the medical profession, but in all honesty, we, we have this fixation on, on doctors as, you know, the, the reference point in primary health care, when in actual fact, it, it has to be much, much broader than that. And I just don't think we've adequately articulated the vision. So it, it's hard for people to get excited about something that relatively a small proportion of the public understands. I think in the communities where exciting things have happened, people do know the difference but it's still so much the exception rather than the rule. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Carol Kushner. Uh, I'm the co-chair of Patients for Patient Safety Canada, but I was also a, a health policy researcher and, and had the uh, privilege of commenting on Mr. Romano's report uh, to the press uh, for several newspapers at the time it came out. Anyway. Uh, one change that wasn't mentioned, and uh, it's, uh, it is an elephant in the room, I think, is the impact of the Shauli decision, which legitimized private health insurance for uh, Medicare-covered services in the province of Quebec. I'm ho I know Antonia Maioni is here. Right behind you. Right <laughs> behind me. So perhaps when she presents, she'll address that change. Um, but I think that the, uh, the fact that Canadians coalesced uh, around the idea that we need to go forward and expand public coverage rather than go backwards and uh, uh, re-legitimize private health insurance is, it still gives me some hope that we can create a more sustainable system. Um, the prospects for the future, though, seem to me, since we have a disengaged federal government, I don't think anyone would disagree, uh, is to come up with new mechanisms for that pan-Canadian view. Either a new uh, coalition among provinces uh, with civil society weighing in. But we have to remember that civil society has taken some knocks in recent uh, years, and it has been uh, undercut by uh, reduced uh, core funding. So uh, the resources to bring this together, I think, either have to come about from a coalition of understanding among provinces and some renewed uh, resources for civil society. Excellent point. All right. We have, sorry, do we have a point here? Two. Okay. Hi. My name is Patrick Boilly. I work with Reflet Salveo, which is the French language health planning entity here in the GTA. Uh, my question is for Monsieur Marchildon and Mr. Soroka. You've just touched a bit on it. While in Canada there is almost a, a large majority that believe in a single payer insurance system, you just mentioned briefly there might be a disagreement on the method of delivery. We see more and more talk about a universal insurance system, but with allowing for more private delivery. And my question was if you could expand on that, and for Mr. Soroka, if there was any indications within the trends as to how the egocentric experience of having a certain amount of private delivery impacts the view of the system-wide 
uh, sustainability with the single payer and private delivery. Did you want to respond? Sure. <laughs> no, I think we'll, we'll go to you. Sure. Okay. Did you want to start? Do you want me? Uh, I think that um, th there isn't m much available data that would allow us to look at what you're talking about, that is to say the way in which privately provided care affects people's views of the general system. I can think of just that one, the kind of Canada-US comparison poll at the end probably has the data that allows uh, someone to do that, but uh, generally speaking, that's not the case. It's, it's definitely something worth looking into. I'll note as a kind of side note that uh, and the, on the public opinion side, a lot of the um, a lot of the kind of details about delivery and stuff. I know we tend to ask. Uh, I, know, I know agencies tend to ask questions that are quite detailed about the delivery of healthcare to like people in public opinion polls. I'm not sure that's really where the where the value of opinion is. I think opinion is useful for kind of general trends. Um, when you ask people kind of general questions that they would have thought about at some previous time. There's something, there, there are a whole range of questions, for instance, that ask about private provision of care. The problem, first of all, is defining, like explaining to people what exactly you mean by private provision of care and what is already private and what is not and so on and, and so on and so forth. The other problem is that sometimes those questions are so detailed that, I mean, of course you get a response. You're asking a yes, no question on the telephone, but uh, those responses aren't necessarily, aren't necessarily so meaningful. So which, that, that's why I focus here uh, on just on the kind of broad general on, on the kind of broad general trends. That does not preclude doing what you're suggesting, which is looking at the broad general trend amongst people who experience private care. It's worth looking into. I haven't done so. I'd like to uh, start from the perspective that this is in fact a confusing and at times purposely false debate, and I'll tell you why. First of all, uh, private delivery has been part of our system, but in a way that we haven't fully recognized from the beginning, and that is that basically all, almost all primary care is delivered by private professionals uh, who are in effect operating private practices in Canada. That is still the predominant model. What do you call that? Do you call that public delivery? No, not, it is not. It's private delivery. Second of all, until regionalization came along, um, Virtually all hospitals were not for profit, uh, profit organizations. They were independent of government to some extent. Most of their payment came from government once universal hospital and medical care insurance was introduced, but they were not, nonetheless independent. Even after regionalization, there are provinces like Ontario where virtually all of the hospitals are private, not for profit institutions. This debate gets twisted because, of course, there are advocates for for-profit, uh, uh, the introduction of for-profit delivery in a particular way, that is corporate for-profit delivery. And uh, they would argue that the whole system is public and that we need this sort of new window to generate in innovation. My argument and response is simply that uh, you have to take into consideration the amount of private not-for-profit delivery that we have. And there's every option, even for regional health authorities, to contract out. But they don't need to contract out to for-profit entities. They can contract out to not-for-profit entities. And this is going on on a regular basis. These are the decisions that are made within provinces. There's nothing that the federal government can say. It can't constitutionally control this. It's up to the provinces. There's full latitude, uh, and what we have is an ideological debate about which is better, either for-profit delivery versus not-for-profit delivery, which still has a public mission, and some kind of arm's length public delivery through regional health authorities. We have to start getting this debate right. All right, we have time for just a, um, a couple more comments. So there's one here, and then we have Stephen over here, and then our third, and then I think we'll have to, um, maybe we'll squeeze you in for, yes. Hello, uh, I'm Neil Fraser from Medtronic, and uh, it's disappointing that we're still talking about what's essentially a non-issue, this public-private debate, when meanwhile the Commonwealth study is showing us 
how mediocre our health care system is becoming. And as uh, Jeffrey Simpson said last week, we're paying for a Cadillac and we're getting a Chevrolet. I'm just wondering why is it that these kind of internationally valid scorecards don't get more publicity and press and why they're not affecting public opinion? I actually think they're getting quite a bit of press, and I think that we talked about primary health care. The Commonwealth Fund focuses quite heavily on primary health care. These are basically surveys of patients and occasionally doctors. Uh, and uh, what we're talking about is patient satisfaction with what is basically private professional delivery of a very narrowly based uh, model of primary health care a model which uh, has not been delivering the goods for a very long time, as uh, Dennis already pointed out. And that's what we should be focused on. We should be focused on improving that system. But the very people critiquing it, including Jeffrey Simpson, who you raised, are precisely the people that hit on the public-private debate constantly. Because what they're inferring is that the only solution to the problem is to move to a system of greater private payment, and that is a false dichotomy. Uh, I, <laughs> I, don't, I won't speak to that issue, but just uh, to the side of that, I just want to emphasize that, well, I mean, the picture that I'm trying to paint is not at odds with, uh, with uh, what Jeffrey Simpson has, has argued, for instance, right? I'm not painting a picture of, a, of public opinion largely happy. I'm painting a picture of attitudes that are uh, better than they were 10 years ago on one dimension, but markedly worse on another dimension, right? And, and, and all the media content analyses also point towards a fair bit of coverage of, of negative things. We are no more pleased with our healthcare system uh, than Americans are, and the overall level of pleasedness is not especially high. So we'll go to Stephen, and then we had two over here, and then I think we're going to call our next set of speakers up. Uh, Stephen Bornstein from the Center for Applied Health Research in St. John's, Newfoundland. Um, I want to ask a question for which there may not be answering time, but it's an issue that both of you raised. Um, <clears throat> one, of the thing, <clears throat> one of the things that changed since the Romano report that Greg didn't quite mention is that there's a whole new issue out there, which is sustainability, which is in many people's minds a shorthand for how can we spend less on health. And that, and uh, you raised the issue, Stuart, that if we don't solve that one, we're not going to raise public confidence. The problem is, and I wonder if you're willing to comment on it, that both the previous federal government and the current one have by stealth altered the debate by cutting back the, back the tax base to such an extent that the health care system is by definition unsustainable and the only way to make it sustainable is to cut the costs, which we all know is extremely hard to do. Uh, the debate about sustainability will be a false one unless somebody starts talking about the money uh, and where it comes from and how it can possibly be feasible to run a European-style healthcare system with an American-style tax system. That's a very good point. I mean, uh, but I would say that fiscal sustainability was actually a major issue in 2001. It was built right into the mandate of the Romano Commission. So already that had come up as a major issue. Uh, in the minds of most people, it related to the expenditure side, not the revenue side. Since that time, there has been considerable tax cutting by governments at both the federal and the provincial level, as well as changes in terms of greater use of tax expenditure subsidies, particularly by the federal government. And you're right, we don't spend a lot of time on the revenue side. And sustainability is a mischievous word because it means different things to different people. But ultimately, it means that balance between revenues and expenditures and ultimately what you're trying to achieve. 
And if we ever get into a situation, and to some extent we're beginning to go there, where you have this silent approach to encourage people to invest, for example, in private health insurance through tax expenditure subsidies, in other words, to encourage people to, to do this on the taxpayer's uh, budget and expense, we're going to be, I think, in a much worse spot down the road than we are today, and that's the most effective way to undermine the system that we've set up. And so that's what we need to watch out for. We don't want to end up like Australia or the United States in that respect. Thank you. Staney, did you want to make a comment there? Yeah, I, I wanted to make a little bit of a comment because to my mind it's something that's changed. And it, it, it strikes perhaps that the question was just asked about why we don't pay attention to this or that study. So I started my career in healthcare in Canada just as the Romano Report was starting up. And I guess my picture or my image of how things worked in Canada was heavily shaped by the fact that there was this very large effort to get coherence around a relatively small number of goals. And that, coming from a private sector background in the States, made a lot of sense. That's one of the things that has changed, is that we don't have that coherence. And in almost any room of sort of scholars since, you know, we had this effort that did give us national goals, you'll raise 10 problems, and 20 solutions and a constant reframing of it. And I, I'll tell you, having come to this country, or come back to this country, when there was that effort on, the absence of that effort now around coherence is what strikes me as the most different thing. And we'll always be chasing this goal and that goal and this goal and that goal until we say, this is what we're going to focus on. And then come back to it after a while again. Excellent point. Thank you. Okay, two quick comments over here, and then we're going to call our other set of panelists. Oh, Tom, hi. Hi. Uh, so, so I'm Tom Clausen, and I'm independent at the moment, so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> but I, I was the CEO of the Ontario Hospital Association and Health Region, a couple of hospitals, so that's my background. I'm really disappointed with what's happened in the last 10 years since the Romano Commission, and it was mentioned by somebody that you should go back and reread the Lalonde Report, which is now almost 40 years old. If you read it, you'll even be more disappointed uh, in terms of what happened in the last 40 years in Canada. I, because right in that report, they talk about actually moving away from acute care towards chronic disease management 40 years ago, although a lot of people think we just discovered that that's a, a good thing to do. Um, I, a, a number of the early speakers were quite critical of the federal government, and I'm, I'm of the belief that sure, maybe civil society, the provinces and the feds all have a responsibility, but the primary responsibility is with the provinces uh, in the way our constitution works. And the extent to which they've grabbed hold of trying to solve these problems with the money that's available is, is pretty spotty as you look around the country, particularly in relation to primary care, which as I mentioned, was mentioned by Lalonde 40 years ago. Uh, we really do not have well-organized primary care in this country in any province. Some provinces are a little bit farther ahead than others. And what really makes this disappointing, if you look back at the last decade, is how much money has gone into health care. We've been pouring money into health care. And then we see the Commonwealth Fund point out how substandard we look on process, but we also don't even look the best on outcomes if you, if you look across the world. And you know, other countries have two-tier health systems, other countries have private delivery. Those debates are silly. They, they don't seem, in my mind, have much to do with, with uh, the ultimate. It's, how, it's how, we've, how our provincial governments have really grabbed hold of trying to change the way their systems are organized and to make them a lot more coherent and integrated than they are right now. That's my belief. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> One last comment here. It's my turn. Do I squeeze in? Thank you. My name is Marie-Claude Prémont from uh, École Nationale d'Administration Publique in Montreal. I'd like to focus on one idea, which I don't know if Greg will agree. I think that it's a good point that healthcare is frozen at this time. I tell you why. Because it means that it's not easy to go backward. And I think that's a very positive thing. We have to make two observations. It's been extremely difficult to establish public health care in this country. We know it. Uh, one of the reasons is because of this divided power between the provinces 
and the federal government. But there's a good, there's a positive thing about it as well, which, is, which means that now, in spite of the conservative governments that we have at the federal or at the provincial level, although they don't necessarily call themselves conservative, it means that it's tough to go backward. And uh, although I have written and talked extensively about the Shaudi decision fallout in Quebec, we have to recognize that, and although we had one of these liberal conservative government recently, uh, I think we've managed to do a great damage control about that. And I think we should build on that. You know, don't think it's, it's negative that we, we can't go forward. Let's build on what we have. And this protection we have, you know, from going backward is a positive thing. Thank you.